uh, environment for human beings because God wanted a family. If God had wanted a family, he wouldn't have created the universe. But he made it all because he wants you to be in his family. So he made Adam and he put him in the Garden of Eden, a perfect paradise, and Adam had everything that he could possibly want except he was lonely. Because he noticed that animals had mates, but there was no mate for Adam. And I think God did this intentionally, two reasons. First, he wanted to realize, he wanted Adam to realize what he, what he would need in his own life. And second, I think God made Adam and then thought, I could do better, and then he makes a woman. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get you back. And so God makes Adam uh, out of the dust, out of the dirt of the earth. And he creates Adam out of dirt. Now he creates woman out of Adam. Okay. Now this, by the way, is why men don't mind getting dirty and women do. Because men are made of dirt, okay? Okay. We were created out of the dirt, so we like dirt. We don't mind getting muddy, messy. But women weren't created out of dirt. The Bible says they were taken from a rib of Adam. Now there's a symbolism in this that God created Adam's helpmate, his partner for life, his wife, out of his rib. He didn't take her from his feet where he would lord over her. He didn't take her from his head where she would lord over him, but he took his wife from his side where he would be her, his equal, his, his partner, and he took him from a rib close to the heart as a symbol of she is to be deeply loved. There's a lot more I could say about that, but that's not where we're going this week. But God creates, uh, he puts Adam to sleep, he creates woman, and when Adam wakes up, he sees Eve in her full glory. And Adam wakes up, and he's never seen a naked woman before. And he wakes up and he goes, whoa. Whoa. Whoa, 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 man. Man, oh man, whoa, man, whoa, man, whoa, man. <laughs> and, and that's where the word came from, okay? <laughs> Woman, whoa, man, whoa, man, woman. And things went along really great for a long time between man and woman because there was no sin. So there was no sadness, no sickness, no sorrow, no suffering, no deceit, no lying, no manipulating, no jealousy, not, none of these things in their relationship. A per, they are the only couple that had a perfect relationship, the only one, because since sin entered the world, everything else is broken. But then you know the story that uh, Satan comes to Eve and, and he lies to her and he says, didn't God say that you can't eat from any of the trees? Uh, in the garden, and of course God hadn't said that. God had said you can only eat from, not eat from one. It's a minimum temptation. Everything else is on limits. Do whatever you want to with it. Just one tree is off limits to give you a choice because I want you to choose to love me. And then he says, uh, you know, God's lying to you. He said, uh, you know, you're not gonna die if you eat that tree, uh, the fruit of that tree. In fact, you'll be as wise as God. You'll be God. Every temptation comes to that basic issue. I want to be God. See, Satan never tempts us to be like himself. He never says, do this temptation, you'll be like me. You'll be evil. Nobody would do it. But Satan says, do this because you know better than God. Because God is old-fashioned. Because God's out of date. God doesn't want you to be happy. You should do this because you know what will make you happy more than God. You're a God. And he fell for that, that line. Now let me read you the story. It's in Genesis chapter three, and we'll pick up the story about verse six. So Eve ate some of the fruit, and then she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate it. Immediately their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. This is where shame enters the world. There'd never been any shame and never any guilt and never any fear prior to this. They suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves, cover up themselves. 
And then they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from God among the trees. But God called out to Adam, where are you, Adam? And Adam replied, I heard you coming, and I was afraid. Notice here's fear again. Because I was naked. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then God asked, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Adam said, you gave me this woman. I'm glad you see the humor in that without me even having to point it out. Adam said, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit. So I ate. Then God said to Eve, why did you do this? Eve replied, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. So God said to Eve, because you have disobeyed me, in other words, because you didn't do what I told you to do, there's going to be a curse now. Everything's broken. And one of the things going to be broken is childbirth. He said, you're going to have greater trouble in pregnancy and you're going to have great pain in childbirth. How many of you are mothers? Can I see your hands? Anybody want to give a testimony on this verse? Okay. You can thank Eve for all that pain. Okay. It says, you're going to have trouble in pregnancy and great pain in childbirth. And though you'll desire your husband, in other words, you're still going to love your husband, He's going to lord it over you. In other words, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be domination issues. There's going to be distractions. There's going to be a power struggle in your relationship from now on. And then God said to Adam, because you also disobeyed me and you sinned with your wife, the ground you work is now cursed. And though you'll get to eat what you planted, your fields will have weeds and and thorns and thistles, so you can thank Adam for all the weeds in the world, weeds and thorns and thistles, and for the rest of your life you'll have to sweat and work hard to get your food until you yourself are returned to the dirt that I used to create you. This is a fascinating story filled with an enormous amount of spiritual truth in it, but I just want to point out the relational truths. Because in this story, we see the three basic fundamental fears that pop up in every single relationship. Now you can use what we're gonna look at today in your small group, you can use it in your marriage, you can use it with a boyfriend or girlfriend, you can use it with friends, you can use it at work, because these three fundamental fears that started in the first relationship, when sin entered, are still present in your life and in everybody else's life and they damage and they destroy potential in relationships. Let's get right into it. Number one, the first fear we learn is this. It's the fear of exposure and it is this. The fear of exposure makes me distant. The fear of exposure makes me distant. Why can't I get close to people? I'd like to be closer to my wife. I'd like to be closer to my husband. I'd like to have that intimacy, that soul, passionate intimacy, partnership. Why can't I get close to the people in my life? Well, my fear of exposure makes me distant. Now, here's the truth. There's a lot in you that you don't like. You don't like it about you. And because you don't like it about you, you certainly don't want anybody else seeing it. And the things that you don't accept about you, you have a fear will not be accepted by others. So you want to have, keep your distance because when people get close to you, they can see you warts and all. The closer people get, the more they see your blemishes, the more they see your mistakes, your faults, your failures, your weaknesses. And so we keep people at a distance because of fear of exposure that people will know what we know about ourselves. And those things you don't like about you, you don't want being shared anywhere else because they might reject it. In verses 9 and 10 of Genesis 3, it says this. God called to Adam, why are you hiding? And Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Now, let me say a couple things. Whenever God asks you a question like this, and he asks Adam two questions. First he says, where are you? And why were you hiding? 
Whenever God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. He wasn't asking those questions for his benefit. He's asking the questions for Adam's benefit because he wants Adam to own up. He wants Adam to man up. He wants Adam to be a man and accept responsibility for the fact that he had run and he was hiding. Any transformation in any area of your life, including relationships, only happens when you own up to the fact that they aren't what they ought to be. And as long as you think, I got a great marriage, nothing wrong with it, it's not gonna get any better. I got great friendships, it's just fine. As long as you are in denial, there's no recovery, there's no transformation. So it starts with you owning up and being honest to God and honest with yourself that my relationships are not what they could be. They could be a whole lot better than they are right now. Now I want you to circle on that, on that verse the phrase, I was afraid and I hid because they go together. I was afraid and I hid. Fear always causes us to hide. I wonder what you're hiding from today because of fear. What are you pretending not to know? What are you pretending isn't a problem in your marriage? What are you pretending isn't a problem in your life? What are you pretending is not a problem uh, in your relationship because you are afraid of facing the truth? God doesn't want you to fake it. He wants you to face it when it comes to fear. What are you pretending not to know? I, I was afraid and I, and I hid. Now also circle the word of the phrase, I was naked. I was naked. What does it mean to be naked? Well, he's talking about more here than just physical nakedness. There's an emotional nakedness too. To be naked means to be exposed. It means to be uncovered. It means to be vulnerable. It means to be authentic. It means you're out in the open. It means you are unprotected. You are never more vulnerable than when you're naked. I mean, it's just all out there. There's nothing to hide. And, 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 they, and when we are afraid of nakedness, when we're afraid of vulnerability, when we're afraid of being open, we're afraid of being honest, we're afraid of letting people see us as we really are, my fear of exposure makes me distant. You see, one of your deepest needs is to be loved, but one of your deepest fears is the fear of being seen for what you really are. And you can live with a husband or a wife for 50 years and keep secrets from them because you're afraid that they would not accept that part of your life. Living with somebody doesn't guarantee that they're seeing all of you because they're not. Now, I want you to notice the damage that fear does to a relationship because there are three stages, and we see all three of them here in this. The first phase is shame. You might write that down, shame. It's verse 7. Once they disobeyed God, the first thing that entered their relationship was shame. And when you disobey God, shame enters your relationships. It says they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. Fear is often based in shame. Now, when you carry shame, you are easily embarrassed. When you carry shame, you fear embarrassment almost more than anything else. And you will do almost anything in your life to avoid embarrassment. That is a symptom that you're carrying unresolved shame in your life. Shame makes me more self-conscious. Shame makes me nervous, more nervous. Shame makes me fearful of being humiliated. And I'm going to avoid that at all costs. Shame means I am easily mortified. Because if you have any of those things in your life, it means there's some shame you haven't given to God and let him take it away in your life. Phase one is they felt shame. Phase two is the cover-up. The cover-up. And what, is, what happens is when we feel ashamed, we try to conceal who we really are, our true selves. Verse 7b says, so they sewed fig leaves to cover themselves up, or to cover up themselves. Now, If you've ever seen a fig leaf, they're not very big. Some of us, it'd take a lot of fig leaves to cover us. Okay. Now today, we all have 
much, much more sophisticated ways of covering up who we really are. We don't have to use fig leaves anymore, but we do it all the time. I wonder what ways you use to cover up your fears, your insecurities. What ways do you cover them up? Some people use humor. And they're the class clown, but they don't let anybody get close to them. They don't let anybody get close to them. And they, 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 they use humor. Maybe you try to cover up your insecurities by presenting an, uh, uh, an image that, you, that you're all put together. I mean, you got the right clothes, you got the right accessory, you got the right hair, you drive the right car, you say the right things, you use the right words, and you give this image that you're all put together, but you're not. You're not, you don't have it all together. You don't have it all together in any sense of the word. But you try to present this image, why? Out of fear. Today, a lot of people hide behind an online image. And if you read their Facebook, their life is perfect. And if you read their Instagram, they have nothing but fun and everybody wants to date them. <laughs> and they are so cool. Stop pretending you've got a perfect life on social media. You're just faking it, and it's revealing the fears in your life. There's a third phase. We move from shame to cover up, and the third phase is distance from God, and that's verse 8. It says, then they hid from God among the trees. Years ago, there was a guy named John, uh, well, I can't remember his last name, but he wrote a book called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? It's a good question. Why am I afraid to tell you who I am? And the answer to that question was, the reason I'm afraid to tell you who I am is because you might not like who I am. And if I share who I really am, not what I'm pretending to be, if I share who I really am and you don't accept me, it's tough luck. I'm up a creek without a paddle, so there's no way I'm going to let you gonna see the real me because you might reject it. They hid from God among the trees, and this causes us now to not only be disconnected from other people, and that's why we have relationship problems with others, but we're disconnected from God, which is why we have a relationship problem with God. And we not only start fearing other people, we start fearing God out of shame. God doesn't expect you to be perfect, but he does expect you to be honest. So the first fear is this fear of being exposed, and that causes me to be distant. The second fear we see in Adam and Eve is the fear of disapproval. And my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. My fear of disapproval makes me defensive. You see, now we move from simply hiding and running and covering up to now being defensive and we start attacking other people back. We're not just hiding, we're now hurling. We're not just excusing ourselves, we're accusing others. And in this stage now, when I, when I have this fear of disapproval, I start pointing fingers at everybody else. And you hear people say, but you did that. You did this, but you did that. But you did this, but you did that. But you did this, but you did that. That's moving from hiding to hurling, from excusing to accusing. The more critical a person is, the more you know they fear disapproval. I'll say that again. The more critical, the more perfectionistic, the more attacking someone is, they're always putting everybody else down, the more you know that person fears disapproval because that's the way it shows up. The more I fear disapproval in my life, the more I'm gonna point at other people and all what they're doing wrong. So you see these commentators and preachers and other people who are always pointing out the wrong of everybody else, they are afraid of being disapproved of themselves. It's coming out, that judgmentalism. We see this in verse 12. God asks, uh, did you eat what I told you not to eat? Adam answered, you gave me this woman and she gave me the fruit. Adam took it like a man, he blamed his wife. <laughs> and by the fact, he's not even blaming his wife as much, he's blaming God. You gave me this woman. 
You know, if you hadn't made this woman, you and me, God, we'd be like this. It's all my wife's fault. I'd really be close to you, God, if it weren't for that wife. That woman, she seduced me. She got me all messed up. And, and, and so God, Adam is blaming not only Eve, he's blaming God for his choice. He's passing the responsibility. Now, you've heard me say many times, you spell blame, be lame. And Adam is being lame here. Now, sorry ladies, but Eve wasn't any more willing to accept responsibility. She doesn't show up either. She doesn't woman up to this. Genesis 3.13, then Eve said, the snake tricked me into eating. So Adam blames his wife and Eve blames a snake. Great. My fear of disapproval makes me defensive. And this happens in your marriage and in your relationships all the time. If anybody says anything that you feel, your wife says something to you that you feel is a hint of disapproval, you immediately get defensive. You immediately get defensive. And you either explain it or you attack back or you accuse or excuse or you say something catty or whatever. My fear of exposure makes me distant and my fear of disapproval makes me defensive. But there's a third fear we see in Adam and Eve and it's the fear of losing control. And the, my fear of losing control makes me demanding. My fear of losing control makes me demanding. You see, the result of Adam and Eve's sin is they lost control. They lost control of everything. They lost control of their future. They lost control of their destiny. They got kicked out of paradise. And now they're feeling totally out of control because they were. They weren't controlling anything at this point. And in this situation, my fear of losing control makes me demanding. Now let me just say it this way. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. The more out of control I feel, the more controlling I become. I start bossing everybody around. I start making demands. I start protecting myself. I start defending, demanding, demeaning. I start dominating. The more insecure you are, the greater you have a need to get your way. If you're a very secure person, you don't need to have your way all the time. You don't, it doesn't bother you. You don't have to have your way all the time because you're secure, but if you're insecure, then you really have to have your way all the time. And you fight for your way, and you push for your way, and you control your way. The more out of control you feel, the more controlling you become. Now this happens in verse 16 where God says to Eve, you'll have yearnings for your husband. In other words, you're gonna love your husband even though you both messed up, but he will lord it over you. The Berkeley version says he will dominate you. And this is where the war of the sexes began, right there. And all the misunderstanding between men and women, between husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, all the confusion, all the conflict, all the jockeying for power and position, all of the tit for tat, all of this for that, all of the you know, you know, bargaining and, and who's gonna be in control of this and who's gonna run this, and that all goes back to this situation here, sin. It's not a whole lot of fun to be in that kind of a relationship where you're not cooperating but you're competing with each other. Would you like to move from competition to cooperation in your marriage where you're not fighting each other but you're fighting together against other things, you're on the same team? How do you do that? What is the antidote that transforms the relationship that relieves these three fears, the fear of exposure, and, and the fear of disapproval and the fear of losing control that causes me to be distant and defensive and demanding in relationships. There's only one antidote to the fears. It is love. Love. Write this down. Learn to live in God's love. That is the antidote. I must learn to live in God's love. Now notice this verse. 1 John 4.18. 18. First half of the verse says this. Wherever God's love is, wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Circle that, no fear. 
So you wanna get rid of fear in a relationship? You gotta get God's love there. You wanna get fear, rid of fear in your career? God gets, get God's love there. You wanna get God's uh, fear out of your education or in your sports or whatever? You gotta get God's love there. Wherever God's love is, there is no fear. Why? Because God's perfect love drives out all fear. You see, the opposite of fear is not faith. The opposite of fear is love. When you invite God's love into the front door of your heart, and last week we talked about your heart as the center of your emotions, when you ask God's love into your heart, the front door, fear goes out the back door, because fear and love can't live in the same house. When you let fear in the front door of your house, love goes out the back door. Whenever you are afraid, you are not being loving. Because perfect love casts out all fear. Why is it that people will stand and watch a fire burning, uh, a fire burning a building down, and no one's, everyone's afraid to go in, but somebody runs in, and it's the mother getting going in to get the baby? Why? Because fear is overcome by love, and the love is greater than the fear. So, learn to live in God's love. You see, this is the result of fear. Notice the second part of that verse, 1 John 4, 18b. It's the thought of punishment that makes a person fearful. What is the thought of punishment? You're thinking about the negative consequences. How many times have you been afraid to tell the truth because of the consequences? How many times have you been afraid to be yourself because of the consequences. How many times you've gone, on a, gone to a party or gone on a date and you didn't wanna say what you really believed because of the fear of the consequences, the punishment you would receive? How many times if you had a friend and you knew something was wrong in their life and you tell them almost all the truth but you save back the last 10% which will make the difference? And you hold back, so many times we hold back the last 10% from somebody because we're afraid we're gonna hurt their feelings and then they're gonna reject us. And we're really doing it out of fear. We don't want to share the last 10%. It is the thought of punishment or negative consequences that makes a person fearful. So how do I learn to live in God's love? You do three things. And if you'll do these three things, it will transform your relationships. These things will transform, they're three daily choices. Every day I surrender, every day I remember, and every day I offer. And if I do these three things, and if you will do these three things, you will transform your relationship. You may have been married 40 years, it'll still transform your relationship. Number one, how do I learn to live in God's love? Every day, surrender my heart to God. Every day, Surrender my heart to God. Now last week when we were talking about emotions, we said the heart is the symbol of the center of your emotions. And so what you do is in the morning when you wake up, you sit on the side of your bed and you say, God, before I even start this day, I surrender the center of my emotions to you. God, I want you to be Lord of my feelings, Lord of my emotions. God, I want you, I want you to control my mind and control my emotions, my mind and my heart and I surrender it to you, and I want you to fill me with your love. Now why? Because God is love. God is love. The closer you get to love, the more love will, the more closer you get to God, the more love will fill your heart. The further away you get from God, the more fear will fill your heart. So if you wanna get rid of your fears, you gotta get close to God. And if you get away from God, Fear, anxiety, worry, insecurity, those are gonna soar in your life. See, because perfect love casts out all fear. So if I get close to God, it casts out the worry, the insecurity, the anxiety, the fears, and all of those things. Job 11, verse 13 to 18, is a verse you might even wanna memorize. It's a long verse, but it's a great verse. It says this. Surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Now you could do that first thing in the morning for 
as you sit on the side of your bed. Surrender your heart to God, turn to him in prayer, and give up your sins, even those you do in secret. Then, notice the benefits. You won't be ashamed. Shame will be vanished from your life. You won't be ashamed. You will be confident. You will be fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath a bridge. And your darkest night will be brighter than noon. Then you'll rest in safe and secure. Rest safe and secure. You'll be filled with hope and you'll be emptied of worry. Hello, does anybody want that? I could have just done the whole message on that one. We could read that verse and go home. Now there are three commands and eight promises in that verse. God says, you do this, then I'll do this. Every promise has a premise. Surrender your heart to God. Okay, God, I give you my emotions, I give you my heart. I do it every day. Turn to him in prayer, you talk to him in prayer, and you give up your sins, that's confession. Say, God, that was wrong, that was attitude was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. You, you get clean heart, get a clean heart. Then he says, notice the eight benefits. No shame, you'll be confident, you'll be fearless, your troubles will be like water under the bridge. The dark night you're going through is gonna be brighter than noon. You'll be able to sleep well, you're gonna rest safe, you'll rest secure, you'll sleep well, you're gonna be filled with hope, and you're gonna be emptied of worry. Wow. You ought to take that verse and write it on a little three by five card this week and put it on your vanity, or put it on your car visor, or put it where you see it, and you read it over and over and over. Do those three things and expect those eight benefits. The first thing I do to live in God's love is every day surrender my heart to God and look at the benefits. Number two, I not only surrender, I remember. Every day I remember the way God loves me. You have to pause every day and remember the way that God loves you. Because if you don't feel loved by God, you're certainly not gonna wanna offer love to anybody else. If you don't feel loved, you're not gonna be loving. It is impossible to be loving and not feel loved. So I have to remind myself every day what God thinks about me. Not what the world thinks, not even what I think about me. What does God think about me? This is what removes my fears. Let me just give you four of the things that God thinks about you, write these down. Number one, I'm completely accepted. I'm completely accepted. Now that's important because the deepest wounds in your life are those caused by rejection. And so we spend much of our lives trying to earn the acceptance and avoid rejection from our parents and from our peers and from those we respect and from those we envy and even people, we are total strangers. We want their respect. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be rejected, even by strangers. Now, there is a myth that says if I could just be perfect, then everybody would like me. I hate to tell you this. Jesus was perfect, and a lot of people didn't like him. No matter who you are or what you do, somebody's not gonna like it. Now here's the good news. You don't need everybody's approval to be happy. The bad news is, you're not gonna get it anyway. The good news is, though, they're always worrying about their approval rating. Do I have enough friends on Facebook? And, and, and so the point here is you need to realize this issue of acceptance has already been settled by God. The Bible says in Titus 3, 7, Jesus made us acceptable to God. Jesus, what he did on the cross, made us acceptable to God. And if God likes me and I like me, you don't like me, what's your problem? I am acceptable. I am completely accepted. Number two, I'm unconditionally loved. That's what God thinks about you. He loves you unconditionally. Now there are a lot of things I can say about God's love, but two of the characteristics of God's love are it's consistent and it's unconditional. In other words, it's consistent. God is not fickle. God is not unpredictable. God doesn't say, I'm gonna love you today, but tomorrow I've got a bad hair day. I had a kid tell me one time, he said, growing up I never knew if my dad was gonna hug me or slug me. Inconsistent parents produce insecure kids. 
And that's maybe where some of your insecurity came from. But God's love is consistent. It's not fickle. And not only that, it's unconditional. God doesn't say, I love you if. He doesn't say, I love you because. He says, I love you, period. I love you in spite of the fact. You can't make God stop loving you. God will never love you more than this very second, and God will love you, never love you any less than this second. No one will ever love you more than God does. And you never need to ask, will God love me today? You never need to ask that. Did I pray enough today? No, because God's love isn't based on what you do, but on who he is. And we always get into trouble when we doubt God's love. When we doubt God's love, we get fearful. Isaiah 54, 10 says, my love for you will never end, says the Lord. I am completely accepted and I'm unconditionally loved. Third thing God says about you is, I'm totally forgiven. So why am I carrying on shame? Why am I holding on to shame? I'm totally forgiven. Do you realize that before God even made you, before God made you, he already knew the worst things you'd ever do and he still chose to love you. He knows the things you're gonna do that you don't even know you're gonna do. He already knows them. And he still has chosen to love you. And because of what Jesus did for you, dying for your sins on the cross, I'm totally forgiven. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Sins are wiped out. God doesn't rehearse it, he releases it. And then number four, what does God think of you? I'm considered extremely valuable. I'm considered extremely valuable by God. Let me ask you a very personal question. How much do you think you're worth? I'm not talking about your net worth, I'm talking about your self-worth. I'm not talking about your valuables, I'm talking about your own personal value. How much do you think you as a person are worth? And you may say, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, let me ask you another question. What is it that makes something valuable? There are two things that create value. Who owns it? Who owns it? Okay. Value depends on who owns it. And the second is, what somebody's willing to pay for it. That's what determines the value. Who owns it and what somebody's willing to pay for it. In other words, value depends on who's or, you know, who owns something. Would you agree that at an auction, a toothbrush owned by John Lennon would be more valuable than a toothbrush owned by Rick Warren? <laughs> yeah. Or a bed owned by a president would be va more valuable than a bed that you owned. Who owns something often creates its value. The owner adds value to common things. Who do you belong to? Who owns you? God does. You're a child of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And just like an oil sheik say, pray, pay any price for that ransomed girl, she's a daughter of the king. Here's what the Bible says about you. You've been bought with a price, bought and paid for by Christ's death. See, value depends on somebody who's willing to pay for it. How much is your house worth? Not as much as you think it is. <laughs> your house is worth whatever anybody is willing to pay for it. And if nobody's willing to pay your price, it isn't worth that. Sorry, hate to tell you that. But it's only as valuable as what somebody's willing to pay for it. But Jesus Christ paid for you with his life. That's how valuable you are. So how do I remember every day the way God loves me? I get up in the morning and say, God, I just want to remind myself how much you love me. I'm completely accepted, and I'm unconditionally loved, and I'm totally forgiven, and I'm considered extremely valuable and capable. And you remind yourself of those things. That's a key to relationships. Then number three, 